Hey, my name is Jan Prosi. I work as a research assistant in Anna Levinas lab at the UNI Tübingen in collaboration with the Max Planck Institute of Biological Cybernetics. I'm really interested in evolutionary systems, self-organization, as well as bio-inspired machine learning. However, I also like to look at evolution from different perspectives, such as molecular evolution, human evolution, and cultural evolution. In this talk, I'm going to present a project where we examine the dynamical regime with respect to its importance for evolvability, task performance, and journalization. I hope that you'll enjoy the talk. First of all, let's take a look at the concept of criticality. Criticality is a state at a phase transition between an ordered phase and a disordered phase, or as we call it, the subcritical phase and the supercritical phase. We refer to the phase that a system is in as the dynamical regime. So this is exactly what our project is about. Many studies suggest that complex living systems operate close to the critical point or at the subcritical side of it. Also, criticality is generally associated with the complex living systems to be generalizable, to be able to learn how to solve complex tasks and to be well evolvable. All of these properties are also required in a complex natural environment. For our project, we set up a model where neural network controlled organisms are subject to evolution. They live in an artificial lifestyle environment where they have to solve a foraging task. Now we are interested in what dynamical regime the controllers of the organisms would evolve towards. Also, we tested the organisms for the previously mentioned properties that we think are essential in our complex natural environment. We evolve a population of organisms with an evolutionary algorithm which has discrete generations. Each generation, the whole population of organisms gets evaluated in the to-do environment that you can see in the background. The orange organisms can eat these green food particles, which they do by just running over them. We implemented an energy model where the organisms gain energy by eating the food particles and they spend energy by moving. We calculate the fitness of an organism by just taking the average of the energy that they had over their whole lifetime within this 2D environment. The neural network controllers of our organisms are based upon the easing model. Now in order to understand this model a little bit better, let's look at its 2D implementation first. The 2D easing model can actually also be used to resemble the behavior of ferromagnets. In ferromagnets, the particles within the material tend to align towards each other for lower temperatures, essentially magnetizing it. However, as we increase the material's temperature, random configurations of the particles become more likely, leaving it unmagnetized. This behavior can be described by the 2D lattice that we can see in the background here. The lattice consists of different sites where each side can be in one of two states, pointing either up or down. Each side also has a flip probability. This probability depends on the neighboring states as well as the system's temperature. For lower temperature, the current state tends to align with its neighboring states. However, for an increased system's temperature, a random flip becomes more likely that leaves the current state misaligned with its neighboring states. In an equilibrized situation, this leads to the system being magnetics and all the states pointing into the same direction. However, for an increased system temperature, in an equilibrized situation, all the states point into different direction, leaving the system unmagnetic. So you might be tempted to think that as we increase the temperature of the system, the magnetization would slowly vanish. However, that is not the case. When we start from a low temperature, we can see that as we incre slowly increase the temperature, the magnetization actually stays quite constant. But then, at a certain temperature, all of a sudden, the magnetization vanishes. So we can separate the system into two phases. One ordered phase, where the aligning ordered properties of the system dominate. And then we have the disordered phase, where the randomly flipping unmagnetic properties of the system dominate. And exactly at the phase transition, we have the critical point. The critical point is characterized by scale-free properties, where the size of the islands of states that point into the same direction don't have a characteristic scale. That goes hand in hand with a diverging correlation in length, as well as the divergence of several other thermodynamic quantities, such as the heat capacity.
And this is also the reason why we use the easing model for our network controllers such that we can measure the critical point. In our controllers, each neuron corresponds to one side of the easing model. This way, the neurons also only have binary states. One exception is the sensor layer, where each sensor can have a floating point value corresponding to the environmental sensory inputs. Also, the neighboring is somewhat more complex compared to the easing model. It is given by a network topology where the edge weights of each edge can have a floating point value that is either positive or negative. Both the topology of the network and the edge weights are subject to the evolutionary algorithm. Also, we let the temperature of the system be subject of the evolutionary algorithm. This way, the controller can um, also more easily evolve into different dynamical regimes. Now, in order to calculate the output of um, one of these networks, we read in the sensor layer, we fix the sensor layer, and subsequently equilibrize the hidden layer and the motor layer according, uh, according to the rules of the easing model. We do that for a certain amount of iterations, then we assume equilibrium, read out the motor layer, and move the organism accordingly. Keep in mind that all that happens within one time step of the 2D simulation. Now I'd like to explain to you how we actually measure the dynamical regime. I already mentioned that the heat capacity diverges at the critical point. However, that's only the case for infinitely sized systems. For our finitely sized controllers, however, we only observe a maximum at the critical point. In this figure, you can see a population of completely unevolved uh, organism controllers with each controller re being represented by one of these curves. On the x-axis of the figure, you can see the temperature scaling parameter C-beta, which we multiply to the inverse temperature of the organism's controllers. Then, on the y-axis, we can see the heat capacity. Also, here we can observe that we actually have a maximum for um, a temperature scaling parameter of 1, which means that we already have a critical temperature in the organism controllers. Now, if we initialize the controller with the lower temperature, corresponding to a higher inverse temperature, we can see that we actually have to increase the system's temperature in order to make it critical. Or, in other words, we have to decrease the scaling parameter, C beta, as this is multiplied with the inverse temperature. As we had to increase the system temperature in order to receive a maximum, we know that it originally had a temperature that was below the critical temperature. This way, we can tell that the systems originally are in a subcritical state. We can parameterize the dynamical regime with delta, which we simply calculate by taking the logarithm of the temperature scaling parameter for which we observe the maximum. This way, subcritical populations would be indicated by a negative delta value, Critical populations are indicated by a delta value around zero. And then supercritical populations, which have to be cooled down in order to become critical, would be indicated by a positive delta value. The absolute delta value gives the distance to criticality. Note that the inverse temperature beta is a control parameter that can be used to push the systems into different dynamical regimes. However, it cannot be used to infer the dynamical regime itself. This is what the parameter delta is there for. This cannot be done as the dynamical regime not only depends on the temperature but also on several other factors such as the connectivity as well as sensor inputs. Now let's take a look at the results of our model. Here you can see critically initialized populations. On the x-axis you can see the generations and on the y-axis you can see the fitness. Each of the lines corresponds to an independently evolved population. We can see that the populations gain fitness until they eventually converge. Now let's compare the initially critical populations to initially subcritical populations. You can see immediately that the two initializations lead to completely different evolutionary dynamics. The initially critical populations evolve rapidly and also converge to fitnesses that are quite similar between the populations. However, the initially subcritical populations have these random jumps within their evolution, which also lets them end up having quite different fitnesses at generation 4000. While the initially critical populations have a, uh, have a characteristic patterns for hill climbing strategies, where they robustly find the local optimum, 
The initially subcritical populations have a characteristic pattern for a random search strategy, where they just randomly sample the solution space and eventually find some good solutions which would explain the jumps. In order to explore the evolutionary dynamics a little bit better, we increase the size of the neural network controllers. The initially critical populations could actually make use of the extra neurons that they had in this scenario, and with some populations reaching even a slightly higher fitness than they previously were. For the initially subcritical populations, the evolutionary dynamics, however, partly break down, with many um, simulations not uh, coming close to the fitness that they reached previously. This can be again explained by the random search strategy, which comes increasingly inefficient for a higher dimensional solution space. In an additional experiment, we increase the difficulty of the foraging task by only allowing agents to eat the food particles at a very low speed. This way, the only reasonable strategy to solve this foraging game would be to break in front of a food particle, then eat it and subsequently accelerate to proceed to the next food particle. We can see that the initially critical populations manage its fine in solving this more difficult task. However, the initially subcritical populations completely fail to solve the task. They remain at a fitness of two, which corresponds exactly to the energy that they gain in the beginning of that 2D simulation. That just means they are freezing and doing nothing, and this way preserving that initial energy and ending up with a fitness of two. So whereas the initially critical populations were able to evolve successfully in different circumstances, the evolutionary dynamics of the initially subcritical populations could easily break down as we increase the system size or as we increase the task difficulty. In the next experiment, we wanted to see how the dynamic regime itself evolves. For that purpose, we just initialized a bunch of populations across a large range of dynamical regimes. In the figure, you can see the dynamical regime delta on the y-axis and the generations on the x-axis. Each line again corresponds to one population um, which is evolved independently. The coloring is done according to the fitness at their last generation. You can clearly see that the initially supercritical and the initially critical populations evolve into that intermediately subcritical regi regime uh, at a delta value of, of about minus 0.5. However, all the initially subcritical populations that are below that value just remain in, that, uh, in the uh, subcritical regime that they were initialized in roughly. We repeated the same experiment with a harder task, where the agents have to break in order to be able to eat the food. Generally, we observed similar patterns with respect to the dynamical regime as for the simple task. However, as we know from the previous slide, the highly subcritical populations completely fail to solve that hard task. And you can also see that in this figure here. All these blue populations at the bottom completely fail to solve the task. Whereas the populations in the intermediately subcritical regime have a very high fitness, the initially strongly subcritical populations, which fail to solve the task, completely fail to discover that intermediately subcritical regime where a high performance would be possible. Generally, we observe that, it, that populations never ascend into a more supercritical regime when they were initially subcritical. So it seems to only be possi ever possible to descend into a more subcritical regime, but never to become more supercritical again. Further, if you look closely at the intermediately subcritical regime that the initially supercritical and critical populations descend into, there seems to be a slight difference in the distance to the critical point for the simple task and the hard task. Now, in order to look at this phenomenon in more detail, we set up another experiment where we evolved batches of initially critical populations under the hard task for one batch and under the simple task for the second batch. You can see here on the y-axis again the dynamical regime and the generations on the x-axis. In the upper right inset, you can see the distributions of delta values within one batch for the very last generation. You can clearly see that there's a significant difference between the delta value for the batch that was evolved under the hard task versus the batch that was evolved under the simple task with that batch being involved in the hard task being significantly closer to the critical point.
So it seems to be somewhat beneficial to be close, closer to criticality when being evolved under a harder task. As for our model, we saw that it's only possible to evolve into the direction of becoming more subcritical. We propose that it's beneficial to initialize populations at the critical point. This way, for an unknown task difficulty, the populations can just discover the optimal distance to criticality for the given task. In the natural world, generalizability is believed to be very important for survival. That is also why we wanted to test our populations for generalizability. You can see a scatter plot here where each point represents a whole population, with the triangular points representing initially critical populations and the circular points representing initially subcritical populations. The dynamical regime is on the y-axis again, whereas this time we have a generalizability parameter gamma on the x-axis. Gamma tells us how well a population performs in an environment that it hasn't seen before compared to an environment that it has been trained under. The coloring of the points tells us how well the population performed in the environment that it has been trained in. So we can see that the initially critical populations, with one exception, are all very generalizable. The initially subcritical populations, on the other hand, have two clusters, with one cluster performing also very generalizable, the other cr cluster performs um, very poorly in terms of generalizability. Now, when we look at the colors, we can see that in both of these subcritical clusters, there are simulations that perform very, both very poorly and very well in the environment that uh, the population has been trained under. So the performance in the environment that the population has been trained in doesn't seem to have influence how well it is generalizable. The initially subcritical populations randomly evolve to either be generalizable or not, while the initially critical populations robustly evolved to be generalizable. In order to test the generalizability, we changed the lifetime of the organisms, meaning the length of the 2D simulations that the organisms are evaluated in. As we were interested in further exploring the evolutionary dynamic and the evolvability of the organisms, we were really interested in what effect genetic perturbations would have on organisms' fitness. For that reason, we randomly perturbed uh, edge weights of the organism's wet network to see what effect it would have on their fitness. On the x-axis you can see the magnitude on the genetic perturbations and on the y-axis the fitness in a log scale. You can easily see that the initially critical populations in green react a lot less sensitively to the genetic perturbations compared to the initially subcritical populations in blue. In order to examine what this implies for our evolutionary algorithm, we computed the distributions of fitnesses that organisms had after an evolutionary operation has been applied to them. We did that for both a fully evolved initially critical population and a fully evolved initially subcritical population. You can see that a mutation is very likely to leave an organism of an initially subcritical population to be completely unfit at a fitness value of around 2 or below. However, an initially critical organism is still quite likely to be left with a somewhat meaningful behavior after a mutation operation has been applied to him. The same also applies for a mating operation. Earlier, we looked at the evolutionary convergence plots of the initially critical populations and found out that they had a characteristic pattern for a hill climbing strategy. Now, we can explain how the initially critical populations can maintain that hill climbing strategy. As they are not as sensitive towards uh, genetic perturbations, they can um, change their behavior slightly with mutations. This allows them to locally explore their fitness landscape and maintain a hill climbing strategy. The initially subcritical populations, on the other hand, have organisms that react very sensitively towards mutations or genetic perturbations. As soon as their genotype is just changed a little bit, their behavior is changed completely, meaning they find themselves on a completely different spot on the fitness landscape than they were at prior to the mutation. This leads to a random search strategy. We could also observe the jampy patterns of such a strategy in the evolutionary convergence plots of the initially subcritical populations. While such long jumps in the solution space may be beneficial in the beginning of an evolutionary process in order to explore the fitness landscape fitter, uh, quicker, 
or uh, towards the end of an evolutionary process in order to hop out of local optima, evolutionary processes mainly rely on small steps in the fitness landscape, such that hill climbing is possible. A random search strategy becomes increasingly inefficient for an increased number of dimensions in the fitness landscape. We could observe exactly that when we increased the system size of our, um, of our network controllers, where we could see that for the initially subcritical populations, the evolutionary dynamics began to break down. The initially critical populations, on the other hand, with their hill climbing strategy, could even slightly benefit from the increased system size. Okay, so in this project, we found out that with respect to the dynamical regime, it is only possible to evolve into the direction of becoming more subcritical in our model. Further, we observed that as we increase the difficulty of the task, the distance to criticality that the populations evolved into actually decreased. The previous two points mean that it may be beneficial to initialize populations at the critical point such that they can find the ideal distance to criticality on their own. Further, we observed that the initially critical populations, which always evolved into that intermediately subcritical regime close to the critical point, are more evolvable or more generalizable and can also evolve to solve more complex tasks compared to the initially subcritical populations, which always stayed in that highly subcritical regime that we were initialized in. In our experiments, we saw that populations had to find a trade-off between performance and adaptability. We saw that a reduced distance to criticality improves the evolvability of the populations, with that also the ability to evolve to solve complex tasks, as well as the generalizability. However, the optimal regime was always within the subcritical regime, despite it being close to criticality many times. So we think that the optimal distance to criticality depends on the system's requirements. We think that it may be possible that natural systems operate in a subcritical regime close to the critical point with the distance to criticality depending on the requirements on the natural system. Currently we're also working on a follow-up project where we want to apply constant selection pressure to find novel behaviors on the populations to then study how that would affect the evolution of the dynamical regime. Yeah, so thanks for listening. Thanks also to all the authors of the project. Anna Levina, Sina Khadji Abdullahi, Emmanuel Yanikakis and Georg Murchis. Thanks for putting all the work and effort into this project. Anna Levina supervised the project, while Sina Khadji Abdullahi laid the foundations with the previous publication. Thanks to the Alexander from Humboldt Foundation for supporting this project. Also thanks to the Uni Tübingen and the Max Planck Institute of Biological Cybernetics. Further, I'd like to thank the whole Levina Lab for all the support during the times.